Uganda, and that makes me a Uganda. Right. Who here remembers Kony 2012? Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember Kony 2012. Do you guys remember Kony 2012? Yeah. Honestly, I was 11. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, might not know what Kony 2012 is, Kony 2012 was really a scam. A scam. Where you had some, some young white kind of American, <laughs> um, young white American kind of college graduates go to um, Uganda, make up a whole narrative about um, a, a, a kind of a, a, about a brutal, a brutal kind of bush warlord. A warlord who had been kind of out of action for years and years and years. And Uganda knew this, mm, yeah. but they made it, and they pushed that narrative out into the into the into the West and and raised I think hundreds of thousands of pounds, saying that this guy was brutalizing. He was he was the bane of Uganda. He was brutalizing, kidnapping thousands of kids, and he had this uh, he had this army of child soldiers. Which he was abusing and using to fight his wars. So that was the that was the Kony 2012 scandal, and as it kind of unraveled that oh who these kids were and how much money they'd raised, and there was supposed to be some mass protests. Yeah, that list of school yeah. but it didn't, it didn't happen. happen. Exactly. So that was a, that was a big scandal that happened in 2012. But what I wanted to ask the panel is, a did you guys have any experiences or memories of the Kony 2012 scandal, and b what do you think the kind of the reaction to Kony 2012 and the kind of the accept the willingness to accept that narrative says about what people think about Africa in general. Yeah, um, I think they're interested to hear my point because, Con well, his name is actually pronounced Con. The the N Y in Atoli is like yeah. Um, so it was basically like opening an, an a closed wound because that whole thing happened 2012. The war actually finished. In the 90s, you know, but um, I mean, the first time I went to Uganda was 2003, and people are still living in um, IDP camps, so where people are moved from the villages into these large areas where people are just in close proximity, like a hut here, a hut here, moved from their beautiful villages, um, all their farmlands, their their ancestral land, you know, their stripped ills. They were moved by the government. I mean, it's a sensitive topic. I'm probably not the best person to speak about it because it's very complex. Um, but, I mean, that's, that's that aside. Here, feeling it now, going into school and everyone asking you, oh, my God, are you okay? Mm -hmm. um, we've heard about Kony 2012. <laughs> um, we've heard about what he's doing to kids right now. And, and then you come in and you're just like, what? This is a war that finished long a long time ago, um, and people are rebuilding and moving on. And then you just, and then you go on Facebook, and obviously it's littered everywhere, and and people are asking you about it. And then you watch it, and then you you get angry because you're like, who gave these people the right? Like in a way, who asked you? Who who actually who asked, asked you? You, you know. You, you know what? It's interesting because I think was it even. Um, you know Red Nose Day, what's the charity again? Comic Relief. Relief. Oh, comic Relief. Yeah, Comic Relief. You know when like that whole thing happened with Stacey Dooley, is that her name? Yeah. Oh, the child. Uh, yeah, holding, and then they talk yeah. about White Saviour and all of that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm to look yeah. at what um, they did, they did. Perfect oh, it's perfect, perfect, perfect example. Yeah. This whole thing of, oh, I went to, because they went to Uganda, he was looking for a story to tell. He, see, he sees <laughs> kids um, and, so, and finds out these stories and, uh, and essentially wants to save them. Let's go and save them. We can do this. The Western world can, can do, do this. this. Oh, it makes me irritated. It's very, yeah. very triggering. Yeah. It, was, um, it, was, it was interesting to see at the time because at the time, you know, the, you know, the Lord's Resistance Army were no longer in Uganda. They were main, you know, I think till now they're mainly op um, operating in like Central African Republic and, mm, and Congo, Congo yeah. and you know parts of South Sudan. So they weren't in Uganda at the time, and you, you know, suddenly, you, 
your feed, everything's flooded. Mm -hmm. This terrible war that's going on in Ugandans. I think the whole world was like, oh, Ugandans were like, huh? Yeah, like, what's going on? What's going on? Like, <laughs> we moved on from that. As she said, this was, this, you know, this was back in the, um, in the 90s, you know, and Uganda had moved on from that. And as she said, it was opening up old wounds because it was, it was coming to a point where Ugandans are trying to um, heal. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. there's been so much divisions within Uganda, especially on a tribal mm -hmm. um, yeah. level, that that kind of, is that, that was something that could easily just throw us right back again, just yeah. to remind people of all the things that happened. And the reason why I kind of didn't want to start off is because coming from a southern tribe, um, Connie's whole thing at the time was you know, this northern rebellion again against south southern domination, do you understand? And it, it, it was like what, what he then done to his own people who kind of didn't join his, um, his resistance was, was, was atrocious, mm. do you understand? So th 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 there's a lot of rebuilding that Uganda needs and needed to do, do you understand? And all that done was just, as she said, opened old wounds and, you know, it could have really taken Uganda back down to... Um, to, to state that it didn't need to be, but most Ugandans were looking at that and thinking that, that that's not the reality. Mm -hmm. We were seeing our country being, it was, it was being smeared, do you understand, all over the place, and then it led to a hundred US troops being sent to Uganda to fight Konya, and you're like, but this guy's not even in <laughs> Uganda, why are you there? So they kind of made us readers, and for me, I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical, you know, this thing happened just about a year, maybe two years after Uganda found oil. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So Ugandans are looking at it, like, oh, so we find oil, oh, and no. then 15 years after <laughs> the war ended, now, now you want to come and care about what's happening in Uganda. Is Kony dead at this point? No, no one knows. He's alive. No, well, mm -hmm. depends who you are. No one yeah, knows. I, I, even, alive. I even watched um, a video today on YouTube, and it was of this man um, talking about, oh, I, talking about he met Kony in like June yeah, this year. In the bush, so oh. who knows? He might be alive. <laughs> 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 Listen, and who knows? There, 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 there are people who, um, for example, there are there are people, um, especially um, northern tribes, who, do, who who believe that Kony was um, wasn't real, or even if he was real, um, he died, and then certain people, you know, the, the government continued that um. idea, it was there for them to continue the war against the new, mm. do you understand? And, and the, it was like the boogeyman that they were going to use to, for the government to just, you know, do it. Because truth be told, the government, which is a Western-dominated um, mm. government, they, when they came in power, they did not like northern tribes anyway. So a lot of people saw that as an excuse for, for, for the government to continue their war against northern tribes anyway. And they would just say, you're part of Connie, you're dead. You're part of this, you're dead. So there's a lot of um, uncertainty around that whole thing and it just kind of made things worse. So why do you think there was this like, disdain towards northern tribes? What was, what is the that goes back to colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, that goes back to um, how the British ruled Uganda at the time. Um, a lot of the northern tribes were given a military positions within um, the, the colonial um, system, do you understand, they were given the guns, they were, they, were, they were basically the fighters who were in place, who, who were put in place to check other tribes to make sure that you don't step out of line, whereas in the southern, we were given a lot of education and political positions, mm -hmm. so it was like, there was this... I mean, can I ask, like, what religion are people in the north typically? It mixed. Um, yeah. Uganda's predominantly a Christian country, but um, you, unlike Nigeria, we're not, um, tribes aren't split across um, religious um, mm -hmm. grounds is just ethnic and you'll find you know all religions across every They're different tribe so it's very much a Uganda is very much a tribal mm -hmm. thing as opposed to religious mm -hmm. I'm just asking that question because we did a conversation we had a conversation with Sudanese people mm -hmm. and it was the same thing it's exactly the Northerners were given um, military mm -hmm. kind yeah. of um, military uh, weaponry and stuff yeah. and it's mostly because of their religion that's this is no no it was just i think because um maybe the, the british thought they were better fighters <laughs> I, I have no it's idea bizarre because the exact same thing happened in nigeria exact same thing sudanese people literally said the exact same thing with the north really? and south divide to do to do just, um also like, maybe easier. the divide and conquer is like that's there's research into the british using that tactic to to colonize so mm. i'm not actually surprised like <laughs> before is unity after there's mm -hmm. huge division and there's confusion as to where the yeah, division where comes, the division from, comes so. from. Yeah, it was very easy for them to do that in Uganda because um, in Uganda it's such a small country, but it's so densely packed mm. with so many different tribes, yeah, yeah. and literally p tribes like a tribe is here and a tribe is there, and they speak a completely different language, mm. and they might they may have some backgrounds where they they recognize each other and they've intermarried and intermixed, 
and some tribes that have like migrated from certain places and now they are they've assimilated there's loads of that and but it was very easy for them to say okay we we want to associate with you and we'll give you the um the equipment the education the prosperity for this region to grow and then the rest is kind of like he's an ak-47 yeah, yeah. so a question to the nigerians on the on the, on the panel do you guys have any memories of Kony 2012 firstly and secondly are you similarly suspicious now of african charities um when they're raising money um and that's not just for you guys, for everyone. So, just to the, to the Nigerians. Um, personally, well, I have. This is the first time I'm hearing of Kony um, 2012. Um, so, were you, were you in Nigeria back then? Or? So, I predominantly grew up in Nigeria. So, mm -hmm. I have no idea of. Yeah, uh, I came here when I, when I was an adult. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have no idea of yeah. that. So, I, I remember like, hearing about it and the uncertainty around it as well. Like, no one. Like, that would be the question. Like, do you believe in Kony? Like twenty, mm. so like you know, that was like Santa Claus kind of thing. <laughs> so I remember that, and I just remember I'm the kind of person where things are so back and forth. I was just yeah, I'm not interested in <laughs> like nobody really knows. So I do remember that, and um, in terms of with African charities, I think it goes even further. And I think one of the biggest issues in Africa, like I don't usually like to put Africa together, but it's it's a common issue. I think is the ability to fact check within the country. And African people naturally we love stories, you know, like mm -hmm. we, like a good story. There's nothing better than a sweet story. And it's funny because there's there's a there's a time I was in the village, and this this story really sticks with me because we were talking about the elections and this and that. And uh, my cousin was telling me how um, when he was in Port the area boys came out and started shooting, and they said that if you don't vote PDP, we'll kill you. <laughs> this and that. <laughs> and then he said that the police came and then the police shot the area boys but the bullets didn't enter so <laughs> after that everybody like voted pdp and that's how they won it so i was like oh wow that's mad like that's crazy so so you were there he's like it's not that i was there it's like, oh, okay. so, the guy that you were that I told you was he there it's like it's not that he was there but he's, that's like, you know kind of when you go back to it, the fact that he was so confident when he was giving that story is because yeah, yeah. <laughs> he loved the story we loved the story yeah, side so we can really believe himself. it and deliver it as something that actually happened yeah. and i think that is an issue that these guys and some charities are actually playing on the fact mm -hmm. that you know there isn't an easy way to fact check things that are going on so we can kind of create not, like in media that's the best kind of platform where there isn't an ability to fact check things because then you can create yeah. the perception yourself mm -hmm. so i think there's a lot of issues in Africa that go back to the fact that, you know, there isn't this ability to quickly fact check. And this love of stories makes things quite blurry that you may never know. So I, with African charities, they could be doing that too. I think one of the saddest things at the time of the Connie, um, Connie situation was the fact that at the time in northern Uganda, there still were camps, displacement camps in, um, at the time. And these guys, when they went, they filmed there mm. and made it seem as though the whole of northern Uganda looks like that when in reality at the time a lot the, you know i'll say the vast majority of people in northern uganda were getting back to their lives they were back in their villages yeah. the, country, the area is beautiful it's growing but they they wanted to show one particular side and it was very very insulting to the memories of those who were lost and to those who were mm. still in the camps but also it was kind of dismissive and undermining of those who were able to rebuild anyway you know so it, it was it, it was it was insulting and angering my mom actually during that time she said that it wasn't happening so I kept telling her what's going on with Kony, etc. And she was like, um, my, my friends and my family in Uganda, there's nothing going on. Mm -hmm. So um, I just didn't buy into it because of that. Did you, did you have to explain that to people at the time? Or did you not bother? I didn't bother. <laughs> I never bother with things like that, to be honest. If you want to get excited by news, just first off, I just leave you to it. I have a different um, experience. Well, I never experienced Kony myself but when that video came out I shared it on Facebook I was screaming Kony 2012 I was telling all my friends and um, I have to be honest I actually don't remember what the video actually said or addressed but I remember asking my mum and she very much shared the same viewpoint as what the video was saying about um, 
making people flee their homes. Um, like mm. our families very much had to do that. And so my mom is originally from Apala, but in terms of in because of running from the rebels, running from Con, they settled in Lera kind of thing. And even um, child soldiers, a cousin of ours, was actually kidnapped by rebels. Luckily he escaped and he's he's fine today. But for my mom and her siblings, it was a very real experience. And so I think it definitely just depends on who you speak to. Uh, my mom has many stories of literally being on the run and bullets flying over their heads and having to eat in like 10 seconds because you don't know when you're going to have to run again, if that makes sense. Yeah. So um, it was my first time hearing about Kony when I watched that video, but my mom very much verified a lot of the stuff that was said. Um, even uh, so I've always gone back to um, Uganda from a young age, and even being in Lira, where my granddad has now settled, like hearing shots from far away, then everyone just has to go silent because if that is rebels from far away and they hear that like, activity, they can come and, and you know hassle you if that makes sense. So it, it was very real. I, I understand that depending on where you're from or depending on where you were in Uganda at the time, some people will say it's not real, he was the boogeyman, whatever. But I think for my parent, for my mum, it was a very, very real um, experience. I think um, it, it, it's one of those situations where what I had been to Uganda um, when this whole kind of turning sort of thing came out. And it, it was one of those, you know, raw, like, is this what Uganda's like? And there was so, I was, I was on, on, on social media, you were seeing so many young Ugandans like me who may have never been to Uganda or involved, who didn't know that much about Uganda at the time, thinking, raw, our country, you know, and, and, and one of the narratives they were using is the silent war, you know, that, that this is happening, but no one's talking about it. Do you understand? So a lot of Ugandans were jumping on it to say, yo, look what's happening in our country. And it took a lot of older heads um, within my community yeah. to be like, this isn't happening now. This is something that very much did happen. It was very much real. Do you understand? And you know, my dad, you know, like your granddad, joined um, you know the mi the military as a teenager. Do you understand? And you know, you hear all these stories of them, you know, fighting, and then they'll be then thinking, oh, the rebels are coming. The rebels are coming because he joined um, you know the government forces at the time, and, and it was like the rebels are coming. The rebels are coming, and it was real. And you know, people being kidnapped and killed and whatnot. And what that done was it just kind of took people back mm -hmm. to that time as though it was happening now is like tr reliving a traumatic experience all over again you know mm -hmm. and and what what these americans didn't re realize is that they did that to an entire country of 40 million people mm -hmm. and, and suddenly you got 40 million people looking at something that was very much real and having to relive it again mm -hmm. and some people not knowing how to kind of handle it you know mm -hmm. so they actually yeah. showed Kony 2012 the actual clip that was circulated around in the village near where I'm from, it was actually shown and everyone in there went mad, anger, like, because it's like, what is this, you know, they were so angry about it and I, I think that's why we have to be very careful. Is that white saving narrative? Yeah, it they is. They were doing something exactly. good when in reality mm -hmm. they were doing the complete opposite. Exactly. And that's what we need to be very careful when we, when we, um, interact with certain charities and all of that mm. kind of stuff and you really need to understand the intentions because mm. an intention is very important and um, clearly they I don't think they had the best of intentions. They didn't. And then they were selling these stupid oh. uh, exactly. wristbands. I'm sorry, the guy they was going towards the kids or, or mm. whatever yeah. narrative they I'm had. I'm sure they made, they made a lot of money of and I know that that guy's aim was to become famous yeah. and everyone to, everyone knows who he is. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he won. Yeah. Both Nigeria and Uganda have both had military dictatorships. However, none of the Nigerian leaders are as well known as Idi Amin. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Is Idi Amin uniquely bad amongst African and world leaders? Or do you think it's something else? I feel like we know about him so much because he was a very, I'll, I'll say stubborn, guy like when he was dealing with the western um, countries and the British and all of that kind of stuff he was so adamant that he would not like follow what they were saying to him or, and stuff like that so I think that's why the west has um, I don't want to say created because I feel like there are Ugandans who um, say that you know Idi Amin created development um, through various aspects in the country 
which is true, and he did do a lot of bad things, but when you look at what the West says on this idea that they, um, not idea, this um, version that they present to us, it's not, um, it's not, Entirely true. Yeah, it's not entirely. Yeah, it's not entirely true. There is truth to it, but there is some pieces that are missing. I feel. I think the way you see Idi Amin really, it, the perspective changes from where you are in the world, and maybe where you are from in Uganda. Mm -hmm. um, I think to the outside world, he was notorious <coughs> for the way that he dealt with things internationally. For example, at that time no one on the planet would dare challenge Israelis and he kid and you know the, he kidnapped two and that's what led to the raid on Entebbe if anyone's ever heard of that um, which sort of launched him first into the public eye at that time um, and then secondly the expulsions of Asians yeah. was something that it, yeah. it shocked the world but from a Ugandan perspective, we could see exactly why he right. did that. Yeah, exactly. um, at the time, Indians were the main business people there. Um, they dominated um, the country in terms of business, making money, and weren't paying taxes at the time. They weren't intermarrying. They weren't integrating into the Ugandan society. Mm -hmm. It was a very um, imperialistic approach that they had. Um, you know, that's why... They, they treated even, you know, the house boys, yeah, and exactly. you know, that's why even up to now, when you go to Indian shops, you find them call, you'll find a boy, and they're calling them, oh, you boy, you know? But then to themselves, it's man, there's, there's that respect, respect that they have. Yeah. They, don't have the, they didn't have the same respects for oh. Ugandans. Um, <laughs> what else? And they, yeah, even though they made so much money in Uganda, you can't actually, in, like economically see where they put all this money yeah. they didn't really build into Uganda mm. so it's like they came monopolized what they could out of Uganda and then were sending it back to India um, so I it's, it's unfortunate the way Idi Amin went about his activities but there's reasons for there's it. reasons so for it. I think um, I'm sorry to cut you off I think um, one of the reasons why he's probably the most notorious dictator um, one of the most notorious dictators in Africa is because his dictatorship went against Western establishment. A lot of the times when we have dictators within Africa, they kind of continue the establishment and they don't kind of mess up the status quo of the West. Mm -hmm. Whereas Idi Amin, his thing was very much Uganda first, like Donald Trump, his thing was Uganda first, you know, he, Grand as far as calling himself the conqueror of the British mm -hmm. Empire, the king of Scotland, you know, his thing was very much, yeah. we're doing this on our own and his policies and everything he'd done kind of was to kind of shift power and that very thing of expelling the Asians, you know, they controlled over 70% of the economy. And that was money that was not, you know, gone into Ugandan societies as a whole. So everything he did was Uganda first, Uganda first. Within Uganda, as she said, depending on what tribe you talk to, they might have a different um, opinion on him because there are certain tribes that he did legitimately oppress mm -hmm. because of that tri tribalism. He wasn't immune to that as well. But in terms of your question to do with why the West seem a certain type of way, is because he went against their status quo. The question to the Nigerians on the, on the, on the panel. Yeah. Obviously, Nigeria has a special um, dictators from Bukhari to go on to Babangida. Why do you not think that none of the Nigerian leaders, however, outside of like, the Nigerian community, are particularly well known on the international stage the same way Mugabe, the same way Idi Amin, the yeah. same way um, Colonel Gaddafi? Why do you think that is? Because we have a very bad track record in terms of human rights. Why I mean, Oh, okay. I was going to say, just for starters, longevity, right? Like, no dictator in Nigeria has been in power for as long as someone like Mugabe and Idi Amin. So, I think that is a clear starter for, yeah. for what I think you can think. Um, so, just going by what they said about Mugabe, um, I mean, Idi Amin, yeah. Amin, sorry. <laughs> I totally, well, I, I don't, so she, you were saying something, like you were giving the, re, she was giving the reasons why he expelled the Asians, because I know about that, and it's, this is the first time I'm actually hearing, like, the reasons behind what, because if you just go online, you see things like, oh, he expelled the Asians, and then he led to the economic decline of Uganda, mm, right, right. like, you don't really know the meaning, right. the reason why he did what he did, yeah. and obviously, I, I'm sure he's not totally guiltless. He did do some things yeah. that were, you know. But going back to your question, someone said something, um, I can't remember who, but they said that Nigerian dictators kind of kept to the status quo. 
um, when the when we got our independence, we all know that the British, even though we have we had our independence, they were still running things behind the scenes, and they put specific people in power, like especially the northern leaders in Nigeria. So you have Abacha, you have you said Babangida and other people, and all of them like it's just the mentality of Nigerians, like me and my, me myself and I, not really caring. So that whole nationalistic. Nigerian pride that oh I'm going to make Nigeria is like making Nigeria great again. Mm -hmm. It's the same. It's the same. It's kind of the view that Mugabe and um, yeah. Idi Amin had, even though yeah it wasn't. But Nigerian dictators don't have that mindset. It's all like what I can grab. Oh let me let me liaise with the Europeans and steal billions of naira for me and my children's 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 children. And so they're complices and they're very like <clears throat> there's no fight or resistance. So that's why when you go online. I mean, for Abacha, for example, I think he was the most notor notorious dictator that we had, military leader that we had in Nigeria. But I think when you go online, and you, you, don't, you don't really, it's, it's not as exposed as, for example, Idi Amin, or you don't see like glaring headlines, oh, Abacha the... They even said some things that Idi Amin ate people, or like you the see something, <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was a cannibal or something, yeah. like he killed yeah. his wives, like yeah. you don't really hear that about Abacha, and I think it, it, all, it all has to do with just sucking up to the, to the West. yeah, to the West, yeah. I think exactly. It, yeah. Actually, as you say that as well, I find it quite interesting, because, you know, we might look at it as it, the West is kind of, you know, the ones that are creating this imagery, or like telling this certain story that doesn't necessarily portray the truth, but you know how the way Donald Trump kind of, he comes out with some crazy stuff, but that gets him in the newspaper, that gets him yes. the exposure. Yeah, exactly. So I, I don't know if there's any research on that, but I'd, I'd wonder if you know there was an element of that in Idi Amin's approach, like sometimes allowing some of these crazy stories or you know adding some fire to fuel because he knows he's getting Western attention and from that, you know, it, it does come with power, whether you use it for right or wrong or what that power is. It gives you influence in the status. So I don't know, but it's just interesting when you make that Trump comparison, mm -hmm. like, is there another way to look at this? And One thing to bear in mind is that Idi Amin was an uneducated man. Mm -hmm. You know, he yeah. dropped out of school, like, what, maybe, what, P5 or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Like, not even an insulting way, but, like, he didn't have the... Um, the general general intelligence of yeah. how to handle conflict, how to handle situations. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, but he loved his country. He loved his country. Yeah. Um, he didn't have the best way of expressing it at times. Yes, however, he he was very patriotic. And I think yeah. with Idi Amin, it's also I think, I think a generational thing. Um, I think Uganda is a very young country. I think we're the youngest country in Africa, second youngest country um, in the world. Uh, so the vast majority of Ugandans were not around during Idi Amin's reign. So there's almost this romantic idea of his era, this golden age of a guy who loved his country and you know who built hospitals and railways Very and this and mm. brought it back. But then I think if you speak to a lot of the older generation who who would have lived through his time, they all kind of tell you things that this guy used to make people eat slippers, to design like flip flops on the street. So it's like. There's that difference, and a lot of young people, I think, because of what we're going through right now, mm -hmm. the current leadership, a lot of Ugandans kind of look back to his reign and say, oh, you know, we wish things we were things happening. were like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. but, but I find that interesting, because when I talk to like um, people like in, in my, my auntie's age bracket, like a lot of them um, understand that, yeah, Amin was a terrible guy, he did a lot of terrible things, mm -hmm. but... Um, I think because of their experience of, as you said, the the um, current government, um, they still. I feel like there are some older people that still look back and say, "Oh, no, we things were yeah, time. things were going on, things were developing, all of that kind of stuff." And um, yeah, it's interesting that. But just just to round up this sign, the time time. Does anyone in the in the in the audience have any questions for the panel or for the rest of the group? Have a comment. If you have a comment. Just to add to what you said, I thought it was so interesting because I've never known how to feel about Idi Amin. Mm. Just because um, if you ask like the much older generation, they don't have the best idea of him. 
I've heard stories about him mm. like what he did to his wives. He yeah, yeah. yeah. He mutilated. Mm. But at the same time, if you talk to a lot of the young people who read up on history, it's like this guy built roads, he built hospitals. You know, he was doing things for the country. Um, and looking at comparing it to our current government mm. and how ungreat they are. That's mm -hmm. what <laughs> it's like, it's how do you feel about such a guy who was terrible and who, if I'm honest, he caused the death of my grandfather, but at the same time, he was doing so much. It's like, what do you... For the country. Such a paradox. One, yeah. one interesting take I'm taking from what you guys have said is that um, a, it doesn't seem the same disdain when you guys are talking about, it doesn't seem like hatred when you guys are talking about Idi Amin. Whereas, if I ask, maybe if I, when I tend to ask Nigerians about the same kind of thing, if I speak about Babangida or go on for too long, people's faces start screwing up because of genuine <laughs> hatred and disdain and dislike mm -hmm. towards those politicians. So it's just, the thing is, it's interesting that there's a different yeah. kind of dynamic. I think that comes um, from the fact that, I think as we've all kind of said, it, 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 she, she beautifully said it's a paradox, that, you know, and not knowing how to feel about it. I mean, simply because we kind of understand the fact that what what he, he did a lot of, you know, bad things, you understand? But if you look at the climate of Africa at that time, it, one, it wasn't unique, but also it's like when we look back at the country then, and then I think it's mainly comparing it to the current government now, where the current government is far from a national nationalistic um, government and for him his thing was all about the country mm -hmm. do you understand and a lot of Ugandans were very patriotic we love our country and we want to see the development of our country so we kind of see its decline right now and then look at Idi Amin's time okay. and thought okay you know he, he brought power back to the people from um, you know Asian controlled economy put it back into the hands of um, Ugandans and it's, just, it's, that, it's that emotional confusion do you understand mm -hmm. where he was good for the country but then there's a lot of pain you know yeah, associated him, yeah. <clears throat> hey.